Hi, everyone. Um, I want to get, give a little bit uh, background about uh, the American University. The American University in Cairo was founded 90 years ago and is one of the leading liberal arts uh, universities in the Middle East and the Arab world. Uh, AUC is a key contributor to um, social, political, political, and cultural life in the Middle East. Today it gives me great, great pleasure to welcome President David uh, Arnold, uh, the AUC president, for the, fa the past five years. Uh, during his presidency, AUC has launched a new uh, graduate school of business, new master's uh, degree programs in science and engineering, uh, expanded continuing education and extended scholarships, uh, opportunities uh, and opportunities for uh, needy and deserving students in Egypt and the entire region. Um, he has also overseen construction, the construction project of uh, AUC's new uh, $400 million uh, project, over 260 acre um, in a New Cairo, and it's a five-year project which will be completed this summer. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, President David uh, Arnold. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for that uh, very warm introduction. Ahmed has been working very hard to help us organize this uh, first ever visit by the team from the American University in Cairo. And I've learned on this visit that every uh, member of the Google team has a 20% project. And I think AUC has been Ahmed's 20% project, uh, at least for the last uh, couple of weeks, as he's help us make the best possible use out of this very precious time. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to give a tech talk. Uh, I'm not a techie, so this will be a very non-technical tech talk. And I'm especially honored to be the warm-up speaker for Condoleezza Rice, uh, who I gather is uh, coming later. And uh, so uh, that's a, a very unique privilege. What I plan to do is take about 20 minutes uh, just to share with you kind of an overview of the changing landscape that's taking place in higher education in the Middle East today. I want to talk a little bit about how AUC, our university, fits into that landscape, and share also some of the insights that I've gained over the past five years during my time as president of AUC, uh, particularly around the question of the training and preparation of future generations of leaders for Egypt and the Arab world. I hope to leave all of you with the sense that higher education in the Middle East is not only crucial for the region's future growth and development, it really is key in terms of global um, peace and stability, and it is therefore deserving of active encouragement and support from all of us, from leading U.S. corporations, foundations, individuals, and uh, international donors. So I'm going to conclude my remarks by explaining why, despite all of the issues and challenges that we see in the Middle East today, personally, I remain an optimist about the future of the region and what we can hope and uh, expect from the next generation of Arab leaders. Um, all of that in 20 minutes, and then I hope that we'll have time for lots of questions. Um, let me start with the changing landscape, because uh, the field of higher education in the Middle East is in a very dynamic phase. There's a lot going on, and I'm sure many of you have read uh, news reports about the number of major U.S. research universities that are establishing degree programs and campuses uh, in uh, a number of the Gulf states, uh, institutions like Carnegie Mellon, uh, Cornell, Georgetown, Texas A&M. And most recently, uh, New York University, which has announced plans to build a new campus in Abu Dhabi. Sounds like we have a technical. <laughs> Computer has. Yeah, don't worry. Swipe your finger. There we go. <laughs> Great. Um, all of these new branch campuses and these U.S. institutions are coming to the Middle East at the invitation of, and with large subsidies from, a small group of enlightened Arab leaders. And there's a, an even larger institution that has recently been announced and is in the process of being established in Saudi Arabia, the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. This is an incredible 
uh, bold uh, initiative to create what I characterize as MIT on the Red Sea. Um, it is uh, to establish a science and engineering postgraduate research institution, uh, a city for 20,000 people with a major research university at its heart, um, with the hope that, that uh, by investing in high-end science and technology and training a next generation, that there will be economic benefits and development uh, spin-offs taking place as a result of that investment. You may have heard of KAUST, as it's called in the region. It's uh, developing research partnerships with institutions like Stanford and Berkeley and a number of other leading US universities, and has recently joined uh, forces with our university in a number of research uh, collaborative uh, enter enterprises. So taken together, all of these elements really are shifting and changing the Middle Eastern landscape of higher education, especially among uh, high-end English language institutions. And the regional leaders that are backing these new initiatives know very well that the oil economy will not last forever, and that ultimately the future wealth of the region depends on the minds of educated citizens. So these investments that are now going into establishing um, a, a number of new higher education institutions and branch campuses really reflect a, a long-term investment, an effort to create and uh, to support both a knowledge-based economy and what might be referred to as a knowledge society in the Arab world. And I think that uh, investment is really the key and the best hope that we have for creating a brighter and more prosperous future for uh, this very, very critically important region. Now, some people find it surprising that in the midst of everything else that's taking place in the Middle East today, that somehow uh, American universities, institutions like our university, AUC, our sister institutions, the American University in Beirut, the Lebanese American University, American University in Sharjah, that with the uh, state of public sentiment toward U.S. policies, perhaps at an all-time low, the demand for the kind of an American-style higher education that these institutions provide is, if anything, at an all-time high. At AUC, we've seen applications both from Egypt and from other students throughout the region growing steadily and now hitting record highs. So why is this happening, and what is it, uh, what is it that uh, we are doing that prompts this kind of response, even in a period when uh, American policies are held in perhaps the lowest regard in recent history? As the leader of an American university that has almost a century of experience now in Egypt, I've had a first-hand uh, opportunity to see the, the effect that American-style higher education has in stimulating the social, cultural, and intellectual capital of the region. Indeed, AUC um, and our sister institutions uh, have really helped to shape the region in very important and positive ways now for nearly a century. And unfortunately, these are not the stories that you see being covered in the press here in the United States and the West. Uh, in fact, most of the news that we see from the region tends to be bad news. Uh, it's about terrorism or you know, uh, conflict. But there are some good news stories out there, and I want to take a minute to talk about what is it that accounts for these good news stories that these institutions of American higher education represent. And I think there are three main factors or themes that emerge that explain the success of these institutions and their durability over the decades. First, each of these universities has demonstrated an ability to educate successive generations of leaders, women and men uh, that go on to uh, be extremely successful uh, leaders in both public and private sectors, um, and who are able to compete very successfully in the global economy. Uh, we find some of them here at Google and other places, and some of the major high-tech companies. We, we find them in a number of international organizations, UN agencies, uh, all around the world. Second, 
uh, these universities, including AUC, have found ways to extend the resources of their institutions to the societies that we call home, encouraging public service by our students and faculty, and also contributing to the growth of strong civil society institutions. Third, in a period of unprecedented political conflict and cultural clashes between East and West, we've been able to serve as an intellectual forum and as a two-way bridge for the free exchange of ideas and understanding across cultures. So I want to be clear that as I speak today about the next generation of young Arab leaders, I'm talking about more than just political leadership because, because I think all of us recognize that lasting social and economic development in the region requires leaders of many different kinds. It needs business leaders and professional managers and entrepreneurs who can create jobs and contribute to economic growth, it requires well-trained lawyers who understand the importance of fair, impartial, and transparent legal systems. It requires journalists who are able to link the immediacy of new media to the values of reform-minded advocacy, teachers who return to the villages and urban schools to prepare the next generation, social entrepreneurs to create NGOs and institutions of civil society, and importantly, philanthropists who are willing to invest in social progress. All of these fields need the kind of human talent and human resources that leading universities are capable of producing. And, all, and progress also depends on the creativity of people like you, who are writing the code that leads to the products and services of the future and allows the rest of us to find the world's information organized at our fingertips. So we need leaders in each of these sectors, and it's the job of the university to produce these leaders and to equip them with the skills to succeed. AUC, I'm proud to say, has been educating precisely these kinds of leaders for Egypt and the region since our founding in 1919. And one of the lessons that we've learned over the past 90 years is the incredible power of education to be a positive agent for social and economic progress. The author H.G. Wells once wrote that, quote, human history becomes more and more a race between education and catastrophe. And those words, I think, uh, today serve as a haunting but needed call to action. Because to win that race, it's really up to universities to impart the critical thinking and lifelong learning skills that are the hallmarks of a liberal arts education. The need for truly independent minds who are able to learn, question, formulate their own conclusions has rarely been more important than it is today. In Cairo today, AUC students, our students, are using the world's most advanced software and hardware, working alongside uh, well-trained professors in different fields to create nanotechnology applications, to uh, pursue advanced biotechnology and the ethics and laws associated with this uh, emerging field. They're producing environmentally friendly products from recycled materials. Our students are also researching innovative solutions in petroleum and alternative energy, and they're doing exciting advanced work in computer science and electronics engineering. But what's most important is that as they're learning the, the technical aspects of each of these disciplines, they're doing so in the framework of a rigorous US-style liberal arts curriculum. And as I witness the contributions and the achievements of our graduates in a variety of fields, I'm increasingly convinced of the power of liberal arts education in preparing young Arabs to be positive change agents in their societies and in the world. Our alumni are leaders in virtually every aspect of science and engineering, law, diplomacy, banking, media, philanthropy, and civil society, as well as in the fields of government and politics. I should mention that some of that is in opposition politics. Um, and while some of the, these uh, AUC graduates and alumni are indeed critical of US policies in the region, their aspirations are similar to those of young adults everywhere. They want a secure and safe society, economic opportunity for themselves and their families, 
and honest effect and effective governing institutions. And with the tools of a liberal arts education, they're working consistently toward achieving these goals. Some of our alumni are entre entrepreneurs like Whale Amin, the co-founder and CEO of IT Works, one of the region's largest software development firms, Akhil Bashir, who's chairman of Telecom Egypt, Kareem Ramadan, who I'm sorry to say is the Microsoft uh, regional uh, director and manager, and senior executives at places like Vodafone, GE, Citigroup, Schlumberger, Reuters, and Al Jazeera. These are in addition to some of our better known alumni, such as, such as Queen Rania, Suzanne Mubarak, and uh, Suzanne's son, Gamal Mubarak. So uh, we have lots of people in lots of different fields doing lots of different things. The second key area where institutions like AUC are making a difference is in our ability to extend the university's resource, resources and the energy of our students into the communities that are beyond our gates and to educate our students on the value and importance of civic engagement. We want our students not only to do well in whatever field they choose, but also to do good as contributing members of society. More than 80% of AUC's 5,000 degree-seeking students are Egyptian, and we've always had an institutional responsibility to serve the Egyptian and Arab community and an obligation to teach our students about the value and importance of doing the same. This is one element of the university's original Presbyterian roots that has not changed with time. Uh, if anything, our commitment to public service and community service has grown stronger over the years and the decades. I could go on at great length about AUC's vibrant network of student volunteer and community service clubs. They work with street children in Cairo. They organize book donations for village libraries. They promote environmental awareness. They raise money for cancer research and treatment. They sponsor core scores of community uh, service projects. In fact, more than half of our students uh, are involved actively and participate in these activities while they're at AUC. And some of them have gone on, uh, influenced by their experience at the university, to create national NGOs focused on development, social change, and transformation. But it's not just our students and our alumni who are engaged on these issues. Uh, we've recently created a new Center for Philanthropy and Civic Engagement, named for our former president, John Gearhart which is using university res resources to encourage Arab business leaders and private citizens to address socioeconomic issues by investing in communities and creating new civil society and philanthropic institutions. So universities can play an important role in helping to stimulate and support a movement towards strategic philanthropy that helps promote and spark social and societal change. Certainly, given the enormous accumulation of wealth that's taking place uh, in the Arab world today, combined with the strong charitable traditions of the Islamic world, we see an enormous potential for the future in the growth and development of Arab philanthropy. And our goal as a university and through the work of the Gearhart Center is to document, support, and facilitate the emergence of these new forces for social change within the region. More than 50 years ago, recognizing some of the long-term national problems that Egypt was facing, AC AUC created a social research center which has really used the tools of modern social science research, field-based research, to tackle sensitive and urgent research agendas in Egypt and across the region. Some of the early work by the Social Research Center, for example, focused on some of the Nubian villages in Upper Egypt that were inundated with the construction of the Aswan Dam. And indeed, most of the surviving work of cultural studies and social uh, understanding the social structure of those villages was a product of the very early phase of our, uh, the work of our Social Research Center. Today, SRC researchers are working with local NGOs and in partnership with the Ministry of Social Solidarity in one of Cairo's poorest slums, Ain El Sira, where they're focused on an innovative pilot project that will alleviate poverty through a combined effort of targeted cash transfers 
and family support services. And as we're reading this, the uh, distressing stories about uh, bread lines and uh, food riots, this kind of innovative uh, approach has tremendous possibilities in terms of providing a model for a meaningful long-term reform of the social welfare policies and social safety net uh, uh, programs of the Egyptian government. And it's a wonderful example, I think, of how a university, using the tools of modern social science research, can help shape public policy, uh, encourage reforms, develop partnerships with local NGOs, all in a way that leads to tangible improvements in people's lives. Finally, uh, we're making a difference in the community through our extensive continuing education and outreach programs. Um, Part-time educational programs that advance the workforce and provide professional development are quite common in the US. Uh, you think about the history of the land-grant institutions and extensive extension uh, education programs going back to the 19th century. It's very much a part of the tradition of American higher education. But in Egypt and the Arab world, these programs are not common. And yet the vocational and technical skills that are needed to compete in a global economy have never been more urgently needed. AUC has a long history of uh, offering adult and continuing education programs dating back to the 1920s. And today our uh, continuing education school uh, reaches more than 45,000 adult part-time learners uh, offering courses in information technology, English language, basic business and management skills, a variety of different, very practically oriented courses that give people the skills needed to get better jobs and to have better lives for themselves and for their families. The number of students coming for these kind of short courses and uh, tr technical training programs has actually grown by more than 50% during the time that I've been president and our plan to move uh, our academic programs into a wonderful new campus this coming summer will actually free up space in our downtown campus so that we can further expand and strengthen uh, these courses going forward. And when you consider the enormous challenge of youth unemployment and workforce development in the Middle East, it's very uh, easy to realize and recognize that higher education uh, institutions have not only an obligation, but I would say a moral duty to extend their reach beyond the privileged elites who can afford the time and the money that it takes to earn a, a full-time uh, degree. So it's important that uh, universities uh, develop and offer these kinds of practically oriented uh, short courses and adult education uh, programs, and AUC is very proud to be an example uh, for the region of how this can be done. The third and final uh, area that I want to talk about uh, speaks to the crucial role that AUC and other similar institutions play as a bridge, a cultural bridge, an educational bridge, a link between the Arab world and the United States. AUC has long played this role in a way that allows ideas to be shared in both directions. And this bridge between uh, divergent ideas is not just a metaphor, it's an everyday reality on our campus and in our classrooms. Over the past few years, AUC has tripled the number of its international students, both degree-seeking students and study abroad students, attracting more than 1,500 students from more than 70 different countries uh, this past year. Nearly 20% of our student body is composed of international students, and more than uh, 30 percent of our faculty members uh, come from the United States. As a result, the exchange of viewpoints on everything from regional politics, the impact of religion and culture on development, the most appropriate path for developing countries to achieve economic progress, all of these issues are fiercely debated and are part of the daily academic discourse that we welcome and embrace at AUC. And this is not a new role for us. Uh, it's indeed one that, uh, that the university has become very familiar with. And my job is uh, increasingly to explain to the outside world that all viewpoints are welcome in the academic environment uh, of the university. 
I was reminded of the history, the long, proud tradition of AUC presidents having to do this by a story that uh, dates back to the 1930s when there, was, uh, there were riots at AUC over a lecture that was given on the question of whether women should have equal rights to men. Uh, so I'm following in a well-established tradition of AUC presidents having to uh, stand and defend controversial topics in uh, an Egyptian context. But we have, uh, this is an institution that prides itself on being an open forum for reasoned debate on complex and frequently controversial issues. Uh, two years ago, in fact, we had Secretary Condoleezza Rice uh, speak at AUC on U.S. support for democracy in the Middle East. Uh, I gather she's at Google today, and she may have a warmer reception here than she had in Cairo when she came to speak on that topic. Um, but uh, other speakers have included, more recently, President Jimmy Carter, who sparked controversy when he spoke uh, at AUC in Ewart Hall after having met with Hamas leaders in Cairo. At different times, we've had the Aga Khan, we've had former UN Secretary Kofi Annan, French Foreign Minister Bernard Kushner, the Grand Sheikh of Al-Azhar, uh, Catholic uh, theologian Hans Kuhn, Nobel laureates, writers, intellectuals from around the world who speak to the Middle East and to the, the world from AUC. And while we don't go out of our way to seek comfort, uh, controversy, we're also not uh, uh, shy and uh, um, retiring about it uh, either. So our cultural bridge runs both ways. Not only do we provide a space for Americans to come and learn firsthand about this vitally important region, our, our part of the world, we work very hard to create the chance for young Egyptians to learn about, discuss, and critique Western ideas, cultural values, and institutional forms. While we've long hosted study abroad students at our Cairo campus, and as I mentioned, we're seeing more and more uh, American students and students from other countries wanting to learn about and gain a deeper understanding of the Middle East, we're also in actively encouraging our Egyptian and Arab undergraduates to travel and study in the US and in other countries for at least a semester in order to broaden their, their education. For us, this dialogue between East and West, between the Arab world and America, is a part of our daily operation. It's embedded in our DNA. And as a liberal arts institution with deep roots in Egypt and the Middle East, we feel that we're at the nexus of this critical dialogue. Our Arabic Language Institute is in huge demand as more and more students seek to gain both linguistic and cultural proficiency. Our university press, the AUC Press, is one of the leading translators and publishers of Arabic literature for Western audiences. And our faculty includes some of the world's great experts and scholars in fields such as Middle East history, Islamic art and architecture, Arab literature, Egyptology, and even Coptic studies. These are fields of knowledge that are essential for gaining a deeper understanding of this complex, historic, and strategically important part of the world. And the students who go abroad from AUC to study in other places and other cultures are in fact living proof that engaging with ideas other than our own almost always reduces what may seem like an unbridgeable gap uh, and enables understanding and even respect for alternative points of view. Institutions like AUC are also crossing board borders through science and technology alliances. For example, our Science and Technology Research Center partners with Cambridge University Center for Nanoscience uh, in some of the nanotechnology work that we're doing. And other research and science partnerships include major research universities in the US and Europe, and recently, as I mentioned, the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. I should note that KAUST recently recruited scholarship students to form the first class of its entering uh, graduate students who will be invited to uh, begin their studies at KAUST in September of 2009. They recruited 185 scholars that were selected from more than 5,000 applications worldwide 
Um, I'm proud to say that 32 of those were from Egypt and 29 of those are AUC students. So we're, pretty, uh, we're very proud of the fact that our students seem to do quite well in terms of this kind of global competition. And I think part of the reason for that is that we really have placed very high emphasis on not just the technical training and education that our students receive, but the, uh, teaching them not what to think, but how to think, how to reason, how to arrive at logical conclusions, and to uh, express themselves on complex issues and questions. Our university is proud to have a faculty student ratio that is about 12.5 to 1, which is an enviable number. We have about 400 faculty members, full-time faculty members, another 200 adjunct faculty members, and about 5,000 students. Nothing is done by rote. We challenge students to think, uh, to debate, to discuss, and they also challenge us, which I think is healthy. And we challenge ourselves. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, over the past five years, we've been in the process of building an entire new 21st century state-of-the-art campus. And we've invested $400 million in the future of Egypt, the future of the Middle East, and the future of our university. This new campus, which will be completed this summer, will enable us to accomplish great things in our next 100 years. This summer, we will be moving all of our academic programs, our research facilities, and our library to the state-of-the-art new campus. And we'll be opening the doors to the first uh, students to study in this new campus in September of this year. If it's possible to imagine, it's a green campus in the middle of the desert. It's not green because of artificial turf or uh, excessive use of water. It was designed with environmental conservation principles as part of the core value of the university. And it's really a model in terms of uh, making the most efficient use of scarce water resources and scarce energy resources. Um, I hope that we'll have time to show you some images of the campus because it is actually quite in inspiring in terms of the combination of the best technology of the 21st century together with uh, wonderful uh, architectural motifs from, that, are, uh, that would feel very comfortable uh, in Egypt and in the region. It will be the, the site for 145 new science and engineering labs, an academic conference center second to none, a 700,000 volume great university library at its core, and it's also a campus like this campus that is designed to promote and encourage human interaction because it's through that interaction between and among students and faculty that the work of the university is advanced and, and accomplished. So in my conversations uh, here at Google today, I'd like to invite all of you to come and visit uh, the new campus of AUC to get acquainted with uh, our university and what it has to offer. And we're very pleased to have the opportunity to begin some exploratory conversations with a number of colleagues here at Google about ways in which we might be able to collaborate and work together to advance our shared values and shared goals. Let me conclude uh, today by emphasizing the fact that since that tragic September day in 2001, I think we've all learned that desperation, despair, and closed minds anywhere can be a threat to civilization everywhere. We all should know by now that development and economic progress go hand in hand with education and that one cannot exist without the other. And I hope we've also come to understand that soft power is often more effective than other forms of of engagement in dealing with the very real problems at hand. Egypt today stands at a crossroads. It's a critically important nation, perhaps the most important nation in a critically important part of the world. It's also a nation that is uh, facing enormous challenges and problems, intractable poverty, unacceptably high unemployment, widespread illiteracy, growing religious fundamentalism and tremendous environmental challenges. Across the wider Middle East and North Africa region, 
the demographers tell us that there will be more than 800 million new entrants to the labor pool in the next 20 years. 80, I'm sorry, 80 million, 80 million new folks coming into the labor market who need the skills that are necessary to compete in a knowledge-driven global economy. So the stakes are high, perhaps higher than they've ever been before, and we understand how demographic shifts and conflict politics can further under, undermine the region's socioeconomic balance. We see the stress on a vibrant middle class and the ever-widening gap between rich and poor. But we come away convinced that we must use education to address these imbalances and to help a new generation of leaders build the necessary institutions of civil society. And while the outlook may sometimes seem grim, educators, by definition, tend to be optimists. Because if we didn't believe that the world could be a better place, why would we bother to invest in the next generation? And as I look at the faces of the young AUC graduates who march confidently across the stage at commencement time to receive their diplomas, I cannot help but to be an optimist, to be hopeful about a future in which radicalism is trumped by education and the prosperity that comes with it, a future in which tolerance and reason prevail, progress is sustained through responsible growth and development, and where the moderate center holds. But optimism alone is never enough to maintain the broader institutions of civil society. If human history is indeed a race between education and catastrophe, then ultimately the next generation of leaders will have to ensure that education uh, wins that race in their villages, in their cities, and in their countries. If the Middle East is to reap the benefits of a global economy, if it is to unlock its full potential, if it is to bridge the development gap, an engaged educational community is one key, the one absolutely essential ingredient for real progress to take place. In closing, I want to say that I simply do not accept the theory of the clash of civilizations. In fact, I see just the opposite lesson, both in history and in my own and AUC's experience in the region. Bridges can be built. People of goodwill want to come together to build a better world. And universities are the place where th this human enterprise, this creative and constructive process can and must begin. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. The floor is open here and around the world, I guess. I've been asked if uh, people do have questions, if they could use the microphone so that they can be picked up and recorded for posterity. OK. Um, my question is, um, so after five years being the president uh, of the AUC in um, American University in Cairo and um, being in the region, uh, in general, how do you see or envision the future of education in the, in, in the region? So that's number one. And number two, specifically to Egypt with the proliferation now of uh, private universities that, that open. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like specifically, how do you envision the future of education there? Well, first of all, I welcome the uh, opening of new universities, both branch campuses of existing institutions and the creation of new private institutions in the region. Uh, my own view is that competition is a good thing, that the more choices that people have, that families have, uh, the better. The key question, and the one that I think is going to require a lot of effort uh, by uh, both uh, those of us in the field of higher education and by uh, the ministries and the responsible government authorities, is really quality control, uh, because a large number of the new private universities that are being created are really proprietary institutions. They're basically uh, higher education for fun and profit. Um, and I'm someone that's convinced that you really cannot provide high quality uh, higher education and do it in a way that makes a lot of money. Um, you don't invest in research. You don't invest in libraries. You don't make the kinds of 
social commitments that are necessary to provide a rich, uh, 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 beneficial experience for students if your main aim is to maximize profits. So I am very skeptical about some of the newer institutions that we find popping up that really are degree mills, that really are just uh, you know, collecting tuitions and issuing diplomas without having a strong commitment to quality and quality control and the education they provide. Um, I think there is an enormous challenge uh, ahead in terms of the reform of national universities. Cairo University, for example, has 250,000 students. Alexandria University is 185 or 190,000 students today. And all of us realize that managing, uh, to pr trying to provide a quality experience for that many students, even uh, if you have well-trained faculty, is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of higher education reform, not just in Egypt, but throughout the region. I'm, pr I'm pleased to see that progress is being made, that there are now more and more countries that are looking at quality control mechanisms, accreditation mechanisms, educational reform policies, and uh, that they're also paying attention to what they need to do at the primary and secondary level so that the students, by the time they reach university, have the skills that are required to be able to succeed at an international standard. So, as I said, I'm an optimist by nature. I'd like to think that over the next 5, 10, uh, 15 years, we're going to see tangible improvements in the quality of education. Certainly the rhetoric is there. Uh, the key issue is really the resources to support uh, that set of goals and the kind of uh, enlightened uh, policy and management uh, practices that are necessary to improve the quality of education that's being offered. I have another question. <laughs> it's um, maybe uh, very specific, but as an Egyptian, um, I always wonder why AUC doesn't have a medical school um, in Egypt, uh, specifically now that, um, um, I mean, we, we know that we have high talented um, doctors. I mean, like Cairo University or Alexandria University, Alexandria University they, um, the graduates are, the, they are highly talented uh, people. However, they don't have similar like U.S. high standards for being for being an, uh, a doctor, and they all like face a, um, I mean, a hard uh, time in order to get the um, the U.S. Um, um, certification or I mean to practice here. So why wouldn't there be something like? Uh, I would say a medical school or at least a program that can teach these uh, U.S. standards for uh, the doctors. Thanks. Thank you. It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. It's one that I'm frequently asked, particularly because our sister institution, the American University in Beirut, has a, has a long-standing, well-established medical school. Um, AUC uh, follows an American-style curriculum, and as you know, in Egypt, uh, uh, medicine is not something that is pursued after you've finished your uh, undergraduate uh, schooling. It's something you go right into. <laughs> we do offer a pre-med uh, program so students can do the equivalent of what they would do if they were going to a U.S. medical school. And indeed, some of our graduates coming out of our biology major or other science majors are going on then to do medicine as a postgraduate degree, including at the newest uh, medical school in the region, the Cornell Weill Medical School in Doha. Uh, some, of our, uh, some of their first students coming directly into the, the medical program at uh, Cornell were in fact coming out of our pre-med program at AUC. Um, there's a resource, there, so there's part of, part of the answer that is uh, related to curriculum and you know, an American, what an American style university can do and where we fit in the educational uh, ecology of, uh, of Egypt. There's also a very serious resource question. Um, the, the Cornell Weill Medical School in, in Doha is uh, being helped by the, uh, the uh, Qatar Foundation to build a, a research hospital. It's an $890 million project, uh, 350 beds. So that's about $3 million a bed. Um, one of my trustees said he'd really love to feel what it's like to sleep in a $3 million bed. Uh, I'm not sure I'd go through that, but uh, you know, the, to do high-end uh, medical 
uh, training and education is a very resource intensive proposition. And to be quite honest, we're putting our resources right now into building a $400 million new campus. That's a big undertaking for a small university like ours. So shwaya shwaya, one step at a time, <laughs> uh, we will get there. I have a question about uh, the relationships of American universities and uh, the governments in Egypt or in the Middle East. Like you said that you are education for critical thinking and at the same time I heard like, several people were arrested for blogging too critically maybe for the government and uh, all kind of freedom of speech issues. So do you have any limitations imposed by the government or any other problems? That's, that's a great question. Um, we operate in Egypt under the terms of a binational protocol. There's actually both a cultural agreement between the US government and the Egyptian government and a protocol agreement between the university, our board of trustees, and the Ministry of Higher Education. Those frameworks really pr provide a lot of independence in terms of the academic life of our institution. Um, Controversial issues and topics can be openly debated and discussed in our campus in a way that if you openly debated and discussed those issues among large groups of people outside of our campus, you might well get, well, people might be upset with you. Um, so there, there is a, a, a well-established kind of place and space that is actually very uh, well respected, I'm pleased to say, by the Egyptian authorities. They actually work very hard to, um, uh, to ensure the security outside of our campus, but to make sure that we have the maximum amount of, of freedom and flexibility inside our campus. Having said that, um, some of our professors, uh, like Professor Sadeddin Ibrahim, have been active as uh, critics and political uh, appoint opponents and voices uh, for democracy, for human rights. Uh, in some cases, their activities outside the university in support of NGO work or election monitoring or those sorts of things have landed them up in detention and in, in trouble. Um, and in fact, uh, Professor Sadeddin Ibrahim right now is outside of Egypt and is not, does not feel uh, you know, able to return because of the legal threats that would exist against him. So it's a very, uh, it is certainly the overall political environment does create an atmosphere that uh, does not encourage the, that kind of broader, more open discussion. But within the, the confines of the university, uh, there is uh, quite a wide scope for um, intellectual debate, discussion on important political and policy questions. We do face some uh, government uh, regulations and uh, censorship in terms of imported books and publications. Uh, some of those are not always the most thoughtful. Uh, for example, a textbook that was entitled The Fundamentals of Maintenance, which was for a course in mechanical engineering was held up by the customs authorities and sent to Al-Azhar uh, to have a review to make sure that it wasn't uh, dealing with a different kind of fundamentalism. So there are you know, bureaucratic routines that we go through that have to be worked, uh, worked out. But uh, this is part of, uh, of uh, operating, again, with the, uh, as guests of the Egyptian people and with the support and encouragement of the Egyptian government. Yeah, so uh, I guess during my last couple of years at uh, AUC, I noticed a, a great scholarship uh, program that we introduced to those that are very, very needy from different parts of, of Egypt and the region. And I just wanted to maybe get uh, or maybe educate more the audience about how this program is going and what kind of uh, future it offers for these people that uh, wouldn't have had uh, such opportunities and how you see it also um, going with the new campus and all the new resources that we have there. Thank you very much for asking about uh, the scholarship programs. Uh, more than 60% of our students receive some form of financial aid or scholarship, uh, either needs-based financial aid or merit scholarships. But we also offer every year 20 scholarships for top students coming out of Egypt's government schools. These are our public school scholarships. 
And uh, those uh, students, we've been doing this for a number of years, and over the years, more than 70% of the students that are awarded these public school scholarships end up graduating with honors or high honors, and many of them go on to graduate school and uh, do great things. About five years ago, we started a new program that reaches out to students from across Egypt um, and selects one female and one male student from each of Egypt's 27 governorates and brings them to AUC. These are students that have studied in the government schools that would never have the resources or the opportunity to study at AUC. And thanks to generous support from USAID, we're able to bring them to AUC. Frequently, they require at least one semester of intensive English language. And then they go into a full four-year undergraduate program with a variety of leadership development workshops, a mid-year conference, a number of other enrichment activities that enable them to really acquire the skills to be future leaders in whatever field they choose to pursue. We now have 200 of these students. We've been bringing 54 each year for the last four years. We're going to bring the fifth cohort uh, to AUC this coming, uh, this coming September. They'll be studying on the new campus. But these are extraordinary students. Uh, we're proud that uh, for one third of them we have the funds to bring them for a semester in the US. And that is a life-changing experience for them. I mean, it just shatters all of the stereotypes. Uh, we had a chance to meet with about uh, a dozen of these students who are studying at, uh, in New York at SUNY New Paltz uh, last week when the Board of Trustees was in New York. And they've had a phenomenal experience, even though they were probably never colder in their whole life than they were in January in upstate New York. Uh, it was a, it's been a great experience, and we'd love to see more and more of our Egyptian students have a similar kind of cultural uh, experience and educational experience of studying uh, here in the U.S. Our aim ultimately is to have at least 10% of each incoming class be uh, students who are coming from the government schools who are on full scholarship and who are not the usual suspects of students coming from more elite segments of Egyptian society. Other questions? If not, I, I think we're at the end of our time. I'm very grateful for all of you coming. I hope we'll have a chance to chat informally after this. And again, we'd like to invite all of you to come and visit AUC. Uh, it's a phenomenal, a remarkable institution and a wonderful place. And uh, we'd be very delighted to welcome you and to have a chance to uh, show you uh, some of the uh, the things that we're trying to achieve uh, with the new campus. Thanks so much.